Okay, hi everyone. I'm Jennifer from Ethos Books and welcome to this year's edition of Meeting in the Middle. Meeting in the Middle is Ethos Books annual women-led conversation series and this year the panel topic is on doing and being intersections of community organizing and we have an amazing lineup of speakers from different areas of civil society. Um, just a note that Dana was not able to join us because she's feeling under the weather. So um, yeah, we hope she gets better soon and um, we still look forward to the conversation we have today and I'd like to introduce our panel. So first is Constance Singham. So she's a writer and civil society activist. Um, she has led women's organizations, co-founded civil society groups and been a con columnist in national publications. She was inducted in the Singapore Women's Hall of Fame in 2015 and her latest publication is Where I Was, a memoir about forgetting and remembering, which was published by Ethos Books just last week. Next, Panelist is Maisara Aljaru, who is a lens based practitioner and writer and researcher. Maisara was previously a journalist and a documentary producer with MediaCorp, and she has also worked with various research institutions such as the Center for Research on Islamic and Malay Affairs and the Institute of Policy Studies. Maisara is also an artist and writer, and she has showcased and performed at Objectives, Substation, Art Science Museum, and the Singapore Art Week. Our third panelist is Rachel Tay, who uses she, her pronouns. Also, Rachel is a student concerned by the disproportionate and unjust distribution of climate harm. Driven by the conviction of those around her, Rachel strives to tap on the strengths and energies in the community to create change. And in Students for a Fossil-Free Future, Rachel and her team unpack how the story of their student activism is told. And last but not least is our moderator for today, who is Jolene Tan. So she's a writer from Singapore whose fiction includes the novels After the Inquiry, published by Ethos Books. And with Epigram Books, she has published the novel A Certain Exposure, as well as her children's picture book, Saturday's Surprisingly Super Duper Lesson. She has also written numerous nonfiction articles um, on equality and human rights for places such as, such as New Narrative, The Online Citizen, The F Word, The Birthday Book, CNA, and Straits Times. So now I'd like to pass the time over to Jolene, and I hope you all enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much for that introduction, Jennifer, and also to Ethos for hosting this conversation. It's really great to be able um, to talk to like a panel with such diverse experiences about community organizing and civil society in Singapore. It's obviously a topic that could fill hours and hours and hours if we wanted to, um, but hopefully this session will give us um, a nice insight into some of the activities that have been uh, going on in Singapore for change making and involving the community. And um, yeah, no, I'm really, really glad to be able to join you all. Um, last year, we managed, I think, to have meeting in the middle in person. So this this year, it's, it's gone to an online format. Um, please do remember to use the Slido to ask any questions that you've got. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start by uh, kind of setting the scene, um, you know, change making in Singapore, uh, civil society, community organizing, all of these things obviously are not, not entirely the same thing, but very closely related. Um, and I was hoping that to begin with, the panelists could give us uh, a little bit more about how specifically they've been organized in and involved in organizing community to make change in Singapore. Like there's so many rich experiences, but perhaps each of you could share with the audience just one example, which shows really the flavor of what you do. So, you know, who's in the community you interact with? What does organizing look like with this community? And also, um, and I'm always very interested in this question, what does success look like? What would be different if the change that you seek came about. I was going to um, suggest that everybody had three minutes each, but now that unfortunately we're down, uh, we're down Donna, um, I guess we can have a little bit more time. So maybe four minutes each, and I'm going to begin by arrowing my Sarah. <laughs> can you tell us more? Um, yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is a good question. I think I would say I started out um, in this idea of like community, like by accident. So as a minority, like 
women, you know, living in Singapore, you are always trying to seek like your community, whatever this idea of community is, right? Um, we try to seek people who share the same lived experience. We try to get your own experience validated. Um, and I think, you know, when you were younger, you like, you assume that this is, you know, something normal, the experience that you, you, you go through. And then when you grow, grow older, you realize, you know, it's not right, right? And you try and seek out um, people you feel like might understand like what you're going through. So um, I think like, especially when I was working as a journalist, you know, and the narratives that you hear about minorities in Singapore or the marginalized, you know, um, you know, when, when I left, I decided that, you know, um, I wanted to do something about it. And the first group of people that I came in contact with were a group of like uh, Malay Muslim women or women who brought in Muslim households, you know, who formed their own circles called Penawa, Beyond the Hijab. I think some of you might have heard of them. And, um, and that's how I guess it, it, it got started. Um, I was very much invested in breaking the, the, the narrative about Malay Muslim women in Singapore and what we know of them, you know. Um, and um, I guess for, for me at least, you know, for us, you know, organizing means creating like a safe space, you know, um, without feeling like we need to fulfill expectations of those outside the community. Because if one thing I've realized is that even within, you know, the civil society movements, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding or like a lot of, of more communication that needs to be done. You know, we assume that we have a space and that's perfect for everyone, right? We don't necessarily take the time to kind of reflect whether that space um, is accessible to, you know, uh, marginalized communities. Um, so I think, you know, to answer your question about what success looks like, you know, for me, it's really like, having that space for the community to feel like, oh, I can actually express myself. I think that's the first step. You know, we always have these big dreams, but we don't realize for some people, even expressing themselves is like the biggest thing that they could do at that moment, you know? Um, and to feel like, oh, I can say what I've, what I've gone through without being like, having my experience invalidated, you know? And, and to have a proper understanding of what this idea of solidarity is you know, um, and to be able to just hold on to your identity without feeling like, okay, I need to give up a part of, of something for the majority to accept me. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, maybe we could now hear from, from Connie the kind of same questions. Give us, give us a kind of example of the work you've been involved in, uh, with whom, whom, what does it look like, and what would success look like? Well, oh, 30 odd years, I've been involved in many, many communities and many organizations and setting up many, helping to set up many groups, you know, and perhaps one of the successes I can talk about is that TWC2, for instance, which was set up as a result of a horrific case of um, uh, maid abuse, a group of us, got together and started talking about it. And we ran a one-year program and gathered the community. And this is where you have a diversity of interactions between various um, communities, the arts communities, the theater groups, and so on, joined us in, in highlighting the problems of maid abuse that year. At the end of that year, TWC2 was, was set up as a registered organization. So they have been working at looking at issues of foreign workers, rights of foreign workers and rights of um, domestic workers. So that's a success. But I also found that one of the, one of, uh, the worries when I first started was that people were working in their silos and, and those were the days when civil society activism was something difficult to do. And individuals and groups were not connecting with each other and not getting to know each other. Worse, they were suspicious of each other. So we needed to build a community of trust, trusting each other, empowering each other. And um, so I was involved in a group called TWC1, which brought together a cross. And that was the first attempt in our history to bring together the different different players in civil society. 
it was hard work, but at the end, we did manage to get a lot of people together. So that was another one. Um, and people became friends and they started working across their uh, uh, different uh, organizations. The latest one that, that I was involved in and I was very happy, again, it was an attempt at bringing people together. And there are ways of bringing people together. And the, the last one, which was what I was involved in five years ago was the uh, Singapore National Advocacy Awards, which again over three years brought people together. And I was amazed at the work that was going on that, we did, that a lot of people don't know about. Again, because of the lack of interaction. And um, so that, for me, the success is getting to know people in civil society, getting to feel empowered and inspired by each other's work. And the more people get to know, more people know about civil society, you won't worry about too much because we all do a lot of stuff, you know, without worrying about, and we don't get into trouble all the time, not all the time, but we, we, we get things done anyway because we are among friends and people who hold the same values. So of course there was AWARE, which is, has been going on for 32 years and of which I was part of. So that is my special community. One of the things that I have always talked about is the importance of community. Because when you're individual, you are just a few people it is a bit worrying. You don't know how to act. You don't know, you worry about what you're going to say, what you can't say, how do we know? But when you have a group, a community of like-minded people, you empower each other and you find strength in each other, which is, has been my experience over 30 odd years. And it has never failed me. Sometimes communities stay for long stretches, long, communities. Sometimes you get together for a particular project and then you move on to something else. But communities are the backbone of civil society activism. Thanks for that, Connie. I've actually uh, got more questions about this concept of community, uh, which hopefully we'll get back to later. Uh, but I'm now just going to pass the mic to Rachel to kind of give, uh, again, a, a brief introduction to give a flavor of what sort of work it is that you do, who's in this community, what does it look like, what would success look like um, for mm. that work? Thanks, Jolene. Um, and thank you, Connie and my Sarah. I think when I was listening to you guys share, I was like, wow, um, so many things resonated with me. Um, when Connie said, we are amongst friends, um, I said I got goosebumps. And I think this is what community looks like. Um, we have not met in person, um, but I feel this sense of solidarity and warmth that kind of like is emitting through my screen. Um, to answer the question about how organization in my life, community organization uh, looks like, I think um, I started off as someone concerned with environmental change and the climate crisis. And as my years of work unfolded, I slowly understood that any sort of change of any nature always calls a conversation of what is the intersection between change and power? Um, what are the dominant narratives um, that are creating certain harms and problems that we see? And these bring about pain. Um, and this pain is what brings people together, right? Um, and I think what my Sarah said about breaking narratives, breaking expectations, um, when we come to realize that um, certain rhetorics that we have been fed about um, the amount of power and autonomy we have, the agency we have in the society that we are part of, um, community then looks like coming together and putting that on the spot, um, questioning what we have been fed um, and understanding which spaces include and exclude people um, and how we can have these important conversations that are able to shift um, that power. So I think to be 
a bit more specific about the work um, behind Students for a Fossil Free Future, so for short, S4F. Um, in January this year, I'm part of a team that uh, published a long report highlighting the links between fossil fuel industries and universities in Singapore. Um, and our team is made out of students from all the universities, most of the universities in Singapore. Um, and after that publishing came a two week campaign um, where we brought um, this awareness into our different schools. And I think that for me, opened the space um, when people started questioning the way that educational institutions um, create their systems and continue these systems. Um, and who is included or excluded in certain conversations about our transition away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy. Um, and most importantly, I think the idea of um, community is at the end of the day, at the end of the two weeks when we look at each other and um, say that maybe the most powerful thing that we have created um, is a space where we all feel like we have been seen as individuals and that our strengths um, can fit into a wider network uh, of change where humans come together and make a better world. Um, and I think um, I'll continue sharing as other questions come along. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh... Like I said at the beginning, uh, but of course feel even more now that we've heard from all of you, uh, really very rich and diverse set of experiences. And uh, for me, really uh, kind of interesting to hear about all the different work that's being done. Um, so as promised, um, I actually wanted to delve a bit deeper into this question of what actually community means. Like. It's something that was on the description for this event and it's something that is in uh, many of the responses that you gave and, and Connie has already said a few things, for instance, about how it's, um, you know, it's about, about staying together. Um, and uh, Rachel also said it's about, you know, uh, coming together to question some of the rhetoric. Um, and Masara also talked about like, you know, a space which is uh, where people can uh, express themselves and, and, uh, and there's a kind of, description there of the community being uh, that that you work with being sort of women and who've grown up in these uh, <clears throat> Muslim circles um, and have been have this commonality of being uh, subject to particular narratives. So I just wanted to uh, ask a little bit more about this because there's different strands here, right? There's the common common experiences. That's clearly one part. Uh, there's also been some talk about friendship, about being together. Um, but what actually does community mean? Like kind of what sorts of groupings of people qualify? Because I find myself thinking like people who have all gone through similar experiences, but who have never exchanged any communication with one another, we probably wouldn't call that a community. People who are friends um, and every week they have a barbecue together, that's maybe some kind of community, but is how is that distinguished from the kind of community that you're talking about here with change making? Or I might see people every day in the office or every day at my uh, educational institution. Is that necessarily a community? So I guess I just wanted to find, to like kind of dig a little bit deeper, like what makes a community or what sort of community are we talking about where we dis discuss like kind of change making in the sort of spaces that, that you've been working in. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Um, and maybe because uh, Connie had quite a bit to say about the nature of community earlier, maybe I'll start with, uh, with you, Connie. Um, what, what are your thoughts about this? I can only talk about from my own experiences. Uh, I know um, one of the things about starting to work in civil societies uh, 32, 34 years ago, that uh, besides the few people you have heard of, everybody's a stranger. Because that was the time civil society activism was re-emerging after a period of silence, you know? So, and also after a period of, uh, after some, uh, some some of the historical episodes we know about um, that people were afraid of each other and um, people, oh, 
afraid even now you I mean spectrum. you're not quite sure what... is it spectrum mm-hmm. you mean yeah yes okay no I just wanted to yes, clarify yes, for the yes. audience um, Mark, Mark, sorry, I know, Jolie, you did say, yeah, we should explain ourselves. For 14 years after the after independence, we didn't even have a woman in parliament. And all civil society activism was silenced. So there was nothing very much happening in civil society because the state decided they wanted to do everything, you know? and. Uh, so when AWARE was set up and it was challenging public policies for the first time. Uh, so we were not in a comfortable space because everybody was questioning um, uh, questioning the reasons for, for us challenging. And not just that, because people were afraid what will happen if we, if we challenge public policies. And for the longest time, that was a real fear. And uh, so one of the things that, so you set yourself and by the time I had established myself as an activist, you gather people, like-minded people. And so I was lucky in that sense, I had established myself. So when we set up TWC1, I did contact a few people who I knew like Alvin, like um, Alvin Tan, like uh, Leon Pereira, like Ching Wee, like um, Chong Ki, and uh, we set up TWC1 for the, for the purpose of bringing civil society activists together. And we had to talk to each individual, each organization to build trust. So that was a one one year program. And that was the first time, as I said. So one of the, one once you have, uh, community, and I'm not talking about community that you know each other personally, but there is an extended community of civil society activists who believe in working towards change. So you may not know people personally, but they are still part of a community that wants to change the way things are being done. And that in itself is the definition of community. The other definition of community are people you work closely together. And another definition of community is people you who have trusted and worked together, went through difficulties over a period of time. So there are different, different definitions of community. I can now claim that I do know a lot of people, very many people who are active in, like Rachel and Masra, you are new, but you have become part of that wider community now. The community that I know we believe in the same thing for Singapore. Maybe we are using different tactics, different vehicles, but we are a community. And uh, so all those um, uh, projects that I have been involved in, I had met with new people, like I'm meeting the two of you now. New people, young people who are passionate and who I had no idea it was there out there till I, till we came together. And I think that's important to come together and talk about activities because you inspire each other and you empower each other. And uh, you begin with conversations, Rachel, get yourself a group of people who believe in the same things that you do. You do, and you'll be surprised. You can get three or four people and that will expand because this, the network expands and then you will get a bigger group of people and you'll be talking about, you'll be sharing values and you will be talking what you want to do. And that's how you build up a more stable community. And then you will register yourself and you become a registered organization. So that's how communities get built up. And, um, I am very proud member of that community, not just of aware community, but as the wider community, because my thought, this is something I learned. One of the things about civil society, you, you suspend race, you suspend age, you suspend class, you work for a cause and you don't care. You don't particularly 
mind, as long as that person beside you, talking beside you, hold the same values as you do. And that's the power of civil society. You know, that kind of trust, that kind of, I mean, you, you, you may not agree with the same thing all the time. And, uh, but you know, you can, you, you, you will hold on to that, you know, relationship in spite of difficult times. Thanks, Connie. Does that answer your question, Julie? Yes, definitely. I mean, that isn't that 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 element that you've talked about uh, values and uh, and beliefs, which uh, you know, it sounds like the, the the secret sauce for you. It's definitely not something that I had mentioned earlier. So there's definitely uh, hopefully something that uh, Rachel and and Masaru will build on as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your your kind of responses, uh, reflections. Um, particularly because we've also been talking a bit about like differences and like inclusion and exclusion. So then this question about does civil society suspend these factors or, or, or not um, is also interesting to me to, to ask about, but maybe uh, I'll shut up now. Um, Rachel, can you, can you tell us what, what, what are your thoughts on this question of, of community? Yeah, definitely. I think these days in the space of civil society and civil action, a lot of the conversation is around how do we maintain resilience and momentum in the work that we do? And I always notice that in conversations and panels that I sit into, it's always a question that comes up, right? Just wait till later. Um, and I think the answer always lies in this word community, um, where people are like, I am in a space with people that I enjoy, um, and that gives me energy, and that gives me um, motivation to keep doing the work that I do. And I really appreciate that Connie's um, perspective on community, I think it's something that I haven't been as much as exposed to as she has, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so I think that my take might be slightly different. Um, when I think about community, I think about how I think most people kind of have this want in them to make a difference. I think everyone wants to do good, um, and everyone craves belonging. Um, they want to be seen, they want to be to feel like they own a part of something and being a stake in something. And combining the two together, I think I something that's very important to me is um, creating a space where every single individual feels like their strengths and their being and the uniqueness of every inch of who they are um, plays a crucial part in building um, the new community that we want to build. Um, I think mobilization is such a crucial part um, of the work that I do and that I've seen, right? When I think about the campaign and I look back at the work that has brought us to people that we are proud to be, I think about the little things, um, little things like whenever we're in a Zoom meeting, um, the opportunity to private message someone like a joke and then we just like laugh about it. The little things like um, someone's in quarantine, can we send them food? I heard the food isn't that great. Um, little things like let's go on a nature walk this weekend. Not everybody can make it, but let's just do it. Let's just try, even though it's early um, and we'll be sweaty. I just, I think it's very beautiful to see um, people coming together feeling like they have a stake in something and that's what community is to me. Um, I think at the same time, I am also careful to not romanticize um, the idea of people coming together um, because when there's identity, there sometimes is unintentional exclusion, right? Like this is who you are and this is who you are not. Um, and I was, in, I was in discussion yesterday about um, climate anxiety and someone brought up the idea of um, the lack of trust within the environmental space is something that's making them feel worried um, because it's a movement that has grown so huge. Um, people have such different views about what change should look like, um, what has been done well, what has not been done well. Um, and sometimes in being convicted about what we think is right, um, that creates a divide. So we can say that, yeah, we all want to do good for the planet. Um, but we can also feel hurt and angry by certain things that happen in the space. So I think something that I'm still trying to figure out is um, how do we navigate these disagreements? 
um, how can we humble ourselves to have difficult conversations about things that don't align in the community? Um, can we be willing to go past that? Um, I'm intimidated by this person. I feel they don't respect my work. Um, I don't feel I can resonate with them. Um, how would it look like to transcend these boundaries that we have set for ourselves? Um, something that I'm interested and invested in further understanding um, in my time moving forward. Great, thank you, Rachel. And um, Masara, do you want to add your views on, on you know, delving deeper into this idea of community? Yeah, I think, you know, whatever, like, especially what Connie said, you know, I think it's a lot for me, you know, for me to reflect on. Um, but I think to build on what, like, Rachel said about small things, I think that's, yeah, very important, you know. Sometimes when we form a community, we are very much obsessed about a big thing, but, you know, it's a small thing that matters as well. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, when I first started doing Brownies Haram, um, at first it was just between me and, you know, um, um, Kristen, and, and then eventually when we did a second staging um, of the performance lecture, we had Yen, our friend who directed, and then we also had Afyan Sa'at, and we had Tini Aliman, so it became an indirect community, and people who resonated with the stories that we shared in our, our performance lecture. Also, I guess in a sense, became part of the community. You know, so I've become to like see community as something that's also like flexible. You know, it's not something that just like um, a one, you know, a, a, you know, it's not just built on like one ideology, ideology alone. Um, you know, it's, you know, about making people feel like comfortable, you know, to, to what extent are they able to contribute, you know. Um, and, and then that's where, you know, people feel more comfortable to, to contribute more and, and things like that, you know. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's, I guess the thing that struck me the most of, over time, you know, is that, oh, the idea of community is not necessarily fixed, right? You can indirectly or, you know, unconsciously form your own community through like one piece of work. Yeah. Thank you. As Rachel, can I just, uh, as Rachel was talking, I was thinking of the environmental issues is so huge. There are so many aspects of it. One of the ways of, uh, of addressing it is to focus on one simple thing, like plastic bags, for instance, you know, and that way you might be able to agree because you get a few people together who worry about that because that's a huge thing for the environment. Um, the difficulty is having too many things in your mind and how do you focus, you know? Sorry, Jolene. No, 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 please uh, go, go ahead. Um, okay, uh, actually so a lot of what's been said um, also was kind of making me think about the next question that I wanted to ask about. Um, and I was very interested, Rachel, in your use of the word mobilization, because mm. when I think about uh, something that's really a very striking example of community organizing that we've seen in recent times, for me, it was um, the fact that a whole load of delivery riders and drivers um, gathered at a Meet the People session for MP in order to um, basically advocate for, for themselves after there was you know, a series of moves like the the, the banning of uh, personal motorized um, vehicles. And and it seemed to me that this was a uh, um, the ultimate example of people with a stake in something, right? They, that you, Those are the words you use, like they very much had a stake in that. Um, but what was striking about it, of course, is that it's not something that we see a lot in Singapore that yeah. we don't think of the Meet the People session as a space for collective action. It's traditionally thought of by a lot of people as a space where people go with their individual um, kind of concerns. And um, this kind of also makes me think about the just the question of space, right? Uh, um, I'm very interested in what the spaces are for change making in Singapore. And obviously this was made particularly vivid with the high profile denial by the Arts House of a launch venue for, for Connie's memoirs. Um, 
they, they also actually withdrew a booking that I had had last year for the launch of my novel as well. So, um, but you know, all of you have worked with, with spaces, perhaps uh, my Sarah, you've, you've exhibited or performed the spaces. Rachel had a very interesting, in, intriguing line in her bio about, about walking to school, which is also about a relationship to space. So I think I'd be interested in hearing more about um, what spaces you think there are for that you have had for your work and what spaces Singapore needs and um, what spaces are, are missing or need to be pushed open right now. So I'd be interested in hearing from, from each of you about that. Um, why don't we start with, well, does anybody want to volunteer to start or shall I, shall I arrow, <laughs> point the arrow fingers? Well, I can start since I have uh, experiences. The trouble with Singapore is the lack of space, independent space. And uh, in our very early work of activism and getting people, mobilizing people together, substation was very helpful. I found substation space was open then. And somehow slowly over the years, um, it continued, it continued uh, reaching out to people or we can go and use the space there. So that was really helpful, but it's no longer there. But um, I'm hopeful that when they form the independent, uh, uh, independent substation company, I'm not quite sure what direction they're going, but they might be able to also then get independent space. One of the huge problems in Singapore, of course, is the cost of spaces. So NGO civil society can't afford to own properties, um, which is where the government comes in. The government should then, and that's the way to respect the work civil society is doing, is to offer independent spaces for independent action. And um, and you would hope that places like Arts House is independent, but apparently it's not. Um, so it's a huge problem, Jolene. I'm I'm not sure how we can uh, how we can overcome that. You know, some of the older organizations are fortunate that they have been around for a long time and have been able to acquire spaces. Um, but um, the new organizations, I mean, even, even the ones that uh, I initiated, a group of us, I initiated with friends, the meeting place was uh, homes of the members, mostly my home, because I'm the only one in this house. And um, no, you, you can't, we can't, that's one area, huge area, which is inhibiting, civil society engagement and action, yeah. Yeah, Masaro, do you have thoughts about this? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, to, to what you said about, I think that, you know, the delivery riders, right, the delivery riders also struck me of a moment where I think when three podcasters, three Malay men, um, you know, were called out for their misogyny in their podcasts, like here in Singapore, you actually saw a lot of like, you know, um, Malay women who were not in civil society speaking out online. You know, they were activating and they were calling out the misogyny. And that was, to me, quite amazing. Because, you know, there's this idea that oh, only Malay women who, you know, you have to go through a certain route like university and stuff would be the ones who speak out. But no, you know, um, you have a lot of like Malay women speak out. No, this is not right, right? To the point that the president had to like call them out as well. Um, so of online spaces, I think, you know, is... is has become, especially, I guess, maybe, you know, for my generation and Rachel's generation, you know, to kind of, like, activate and mobilize ourselves. Um, to what Connie said about the substation, definitely, you know, that's where Brown is Haram started. And I think, um, you know, um, the substation also, you know, it's not just, like, for civil society, like, societies or artists who want to do critical work, but um, I'm not sure if many remember, but it's also a space for a lot of... Um, People in the punk scene, right? Which were like mini made, made up of like uh, Malay men, working class Malay men who were in into the scene. So, I think having that space to just like exist, an independent space like what Connie said, 
you know, it is very important and, and it's very obvious it's being like clamped down. And I guess that's why you see a lot more like younger generations going online, mm. you know, um, um, as a way to like express themselves. But I think over time in my work also, I had like, you know, other spaces that, that were, I guess, you know, kind enough you know, um, like objectives, you know, I did my first exhibition there and it wasn't just about, to me, what was important was, it wasn't just about the physical space, but, you know, speaking to the team and objectives, you know, um, and speaking to my curator, Puyi, and, and we had honest conversations about my work and, and then willing to listen and learn, I think that is also very important. You know, like who you work with. When you talk about space, you always think about physical space, but it actually goes beyond that, Right. Like if you're running a space, you know, how do you work with others? How do you make like the space accessible, you know? Um, so I think Objective did an amazing job when I first started out, you know, and then I had the privilege of like staging a, a show, you know, with a good friend at, at, at Substation. And, and I think, you know, we definitely need more of that space, that kind of space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just want to add to what my, my Sarah reminded me of the virtual space that can also be a virtual community. Mm. Mm-hmm. So yes. social media has expanded in that sense that they ha- it has expanded our reach. And yeah. um, maybe we are not making better use of it. Well, this is, this is great. There is a community out there listening. And uh, <laughs> yes, and here we are. So, so yeah, I, yeah, I didn't recognize that. Yeah. I mean, yes, it, is, it does exist, yeah. Part of me kind of wants to probe, uh, especially this question of what is independent uh, for a bit further, but I've just got half an eye on the time and we need to move to Q&A soon. So I wanted to give Rachel a chance to also kind of talk about this question of space. Um, and then maybe we can pick up some of these threads later in the Q&A, in addition to answering the audience questions. So audience, please keep those questions coming in. Thanks, Jolene. Um, I think when Connie was talking about um, spaces of organization at her house. My Sarah was talking about um, digital spaces of organization. Um, I think it was interesting to me to then begin to see how private spaces start to become spaces where we feel the most agency to create change for the public. Um, especially when we think about change making, I think in the most recent years, it looks like uh, petitions, petitions um, that take the form of a website, change.org. Um, I think most strikingly for me, a couple of years ago, when Greta Thunberg first did uh, her school climate strikes in the, uh, in the European areas, and then it um, became a global movement, people in Singapore were like, where is our strike? Where can we skip school? How can we tell the government it's something we care about? And immediately, we turned to the digital space. So how it looked like was um, taking up that digital space with um, content that aligned with the global movement. And I think it's also at this point quite timely for me to explain the, the, the sentence in my bio about walking to school. I thought it was quite amusing that I think Jolene uh, assumed that it meant like a literal walking to school. I think the context behind uh, why walking to school has such a significant, I think, part of my understanding of civil society is um, in a response to our campaign in January, um, there was a Facebook post that came out um, from Ho Ching and she reposted uh, our feature from Channel News Asia with um, the caption that conveyed uh, something like, uh, I wonder if the students behind this campaign um, don't use electricity, um, don't use fossil fuels in their, da- in their daily lives and walk to school. And it was just a simple sentence. And I think... For me, it then was very telling of the kind of attitude that I think um, the institution takes towards um, new voices, uh, wanting to open conversations about how things are done and how things have been done. Um, And in that sense, it is a space that is not physical, it's not um, digital as well. It's um, where is the space for these voices of alternative narratives? Um, Where is the space of perhaps minority communities who have um, needs and interests that differ from the dominant one. And I am still trying to figure that out, um, understanding 
which are the best spaces where change can occur, I think also quite close to my heart. Um, I studied in Yale and U.S. College, and um, when we have conversations about divestment and uh, how change making works in different universities, we always acknowledge that I have been very privileged to be in a community where uh, physical space does not face much bureaucracy. So we're able to set up booths, able to put up banners. Um, there, are, there isn't that barrier to enter that space. But I think following the announcement in August that um, the college would be merging slash moving down slash I don't know. I think it's also a stripping away of that space and um, yeah, <laughs> it's devastating. No, no, thanks for sharing that. And I have to say, and, and it's 100% true. I didn't realize that by picking up a boy to school, I had inadvertently stumbled into this controversy. But for me, that's so interesting mm. that, um, again, it goes back to for me to that, that example, again, of the delivery riders, right? Mm. Like, because that is a space that was seen as just for individuals to go. Mm. And it was so unusual for there to be a collective use of that space. And then conversely, in the response to you, when you're calling for the collective space of Singapore to do something, the response is, but have you sacrificed your individual space yet? As if that yes. space doesn't belong to us all and we don't legitimately yeah. have a place there. Um, so that's mean, really fascinating to me. The space. I also want to apologize for going back and forth. I'm not, I wasn't ignoring you and my cat was just scratching at the wall, first to be let in and then to be let out. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks Thanks to all the panelists for this discussion. I'm just conscious of time. I think we need to move on to address the, the audience questions now. And we've got quite a few questions from the audience. So that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go with the will of the people. There are the most upvotes for a question from Christian. Um, Christian says, how do we resist the co-optation of community or community building? And here I'm thinking about laws mandating registration or needing funding from sources, etc. cetera. Um, so does anybody want to respond to that? Of course, the big, the big problem of our funding is our government um, controls most of the resources, including funding resources. And uh, so NGOs have to work very hard to raise their own funds, um, which takes a lot of energy to... What was the first part of the question? Sorry, Jolene, I missed that. It was about how we resist the co-optation of this notion of community and community building. And I actually think this might tie into what I was saying earlier, when you, you and Masara both talked about the need for independent spaces. And that's also actually what Rachel was saying with not facing bureaucracy. So I think the question may be um, how to resist the co-optation of community or community building. Maybe another way to put it is how do we keep communities and community building in independent? What does that mean? How do we resist it? Perhaps is it the case that if you're required to register and you're required to get funding from certain sources, you then lose that, that independence is, is what I'm taking away from this question. I hope I'm reading it correctly. You, you can, I mean, you can have independent uh, ac action without registering for a period. You can do that because um, my own experience has been that that uh, for three years, five years, the, and the award committee uh, managed to without, without registering. And, uh, and we raised funds by approaching individuals uh, because we were awarding, awarding uh, the winners some cash money as well, because we wanted to help the organization. So it's possible, it's possible to, if you don't have very big ambitions, but you want to change society, you can change society by having conversations. And that doesn't need registration. Over the many years we've had people getting together and talking, 
just having conversations, you know, because having conversations, you acquire knowledge, you empower yourself, you inspire yourself, and you build that community, you know, the biblical thing about a mustard seed, that community can grow. And, and whatever changes we've had worked, it, it worked because the community, people changed attitudes. I mean, when you change attitudes, then you can advocate for change more successfully. Any change that has happened in Singapore happened because people advocated. Remember 19, uh, 2011 election. There was no, no registered organization as such, but people were meeting in Honglin Park, individuals were organizing in Honglin Park, holding rallies, talking about the problems of poverty, overpopulation, and so on. So 1911 election, people were protesting against public policies. And it changed soon after that, policies changed. HDB policies changed, uh, immigration policies changed, the silver health scheme was um, doled out. You know, I'm so glad because I gained in that pioneer, pioneer generation. So all that happened because people were angry and they expressed their anger and they didn't have to have an organization to do that. So it's possible. It is possible. Thanks, Connie. Uh, I don't know if uh, Masara, is there anything that you want to add on this question of like cooptation or, or communities losing independence? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, obviously, you know, when you do like a piece of work, you know, um, one thing I realized, like, you definitely will have like comments from people from the state who are like, oh, you know, I write your work and I agree with you for some reason, right? Um, and there's always that, that, that maybe, you know, you might start off as very like, Op, like optimistic like okay yes you know like maybe they want to listen to you but I think it's worth also like taking a step back you know and I think that's why history is important like you know what Connie shared to to realize that you know people have always resisted for a very long time um, I think one thing that I've often heard from you know from skeptics is that oh Singapore has no history of like resistance which is not true right um, and I think that has been something that I been holding on for quite a while, you know, um, that, hey, this, I, this history of resistance has existed in Singapore for a very long time, you know, and, and it may be very tempting, okay, I need money to do something, you know, um, but, you know, do, do, is there a way around it? Yeah, I think that's something that, you know, I've, I've, I guess over time, you know, especially when I do like shows and exhibitions, like, you know, um, is there a way for me to like, do what I want to do, you know, um, and resist, you know, structures that have been put in place yeah of course you know you know it takes a while and takes some sort of like like you know telling yourself like you can do it um but yeah it's, it's that you know i think the idea of like resisting um being co-opted you know really for me at least goes back into telling myself that we've always had a history of resistance thanks for that um just looking at the other questions that have been submitted by the audience uh, the next most popular question is uh, about uh, whether the panel has struggled with the tension of being, uh, and this is put in quotes, uh, privileged, um, whether it's in terms of race or education, and I'm assuming there could be many other kinds that's implied here, um, and then taking up too much space um, in activism. So it's, it's interesting because just now we were talking about the lack of space, but then now we're asked, do we take up too much space? Um, yeah, anybody who wants to, to take this one on? I can start with a non-answer. Um, I think this is the thought that keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. I, I struggle with the tension a lot. Um, I think being able to be seen as a change maker or 
what might be described as an activist is in itself a privilege. And it's a privilege that um, I am very aware of and I'm very grateful for. And I think um, that also comes with a responsibility. Um, and that responsibility to me, I comprehend it as um, one that I never want to take on myself to represent anyone else. Um, I think when we talk about things like justice um, and in the work that I'm most familiar with, environmental injustice, the tendency to refer to um, climate activism work as representing the voices of people who don't, uh, who aren't in a position to be heard um, is a tendency that I find myself falling into. But I remind myself that I'm never in a position where I can represent someone else and I can represent their experiences and I cannot speak to those um, and how it would then look like to give power to these voices, um, I think is an intentional move from um, the groups that I've seen around me to move from representing to inviting these voices into the space. For instance, um, I have a close friend who is part of a group called Green Check and Green Check brings um, environmental groups from spaces that are directly impacted by um, climate devastation or MAPA, most, affect, most affected places and areas into conversations um, that perhaps have more spaces for these topics to be brought up. So how this might look like is to have a panel um, with people from different countries um, whose backgrounds and experiences with the climate have differed. And I think one of a more local example is um, a group that I very much respect, SG Climate Rally. Um, they held a talk a few years ago where they invited um, survivors of um, a fire that was going on in Thailand, if I'm not wrong, to share about how it's like on the ground. And I think always remembering um, that power is something that I think it's fluid, should never stay um, at the same place for the sake of stability and convenience and ease. Um, yeah, that's what I have in my head at the moment. And I'm very interested um, to hear what the other panelists. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so just a reminder, the question was about whether you've ever struggled with this idea that you, you're privileged and might be taking up too much space in, in activism. Well, I don't know about taking too much space. We're all always fighting, struggling to be heard, you know? Um, about be, being in a privileged position, you know, civil society activism, especially organized activism and advocacy work was always a middle class thing. Because if people who, I mean, we can understand injustice, I mean, human rights issues, you don't have to be poor or rich to be able to be compassionate and understand human rights issues. So in that sense, I mean, about, uh, about advocating for better uh, human rights of domestic workers and foreign workers, you don't have to be a they don't have the rights to do that, but we have as citizens, we do have the responsibility to do that. Um, we can't speak for poor women. Poor women are living day to day. Their concern is just surviving. And so it has always been those people who had the time, um, maybe not the time, some of the resources, we all worked very hard. To, to speak up for those who have no voice. So I don't feel that I'm privileged. I feel I'm privileged because I can articulate these ideas, um, but I feel a sense of responsibility for fellow human beings and an obligation because of my privilege that I have an obligation to speak up. Yeah, thank, thanks, Connie. 
and um, what you said about uh, how people are, are, are uh, more, more able to access a lot of advocacy if they're, if they're middle class. I mean, I also think about, you know, if, if you have a march and, you know, obviously we don't, we don't really march in Singapore, but like, for example, like gender is also a thing, right? Like who's, who's holding the baby <laughs> um, yeah, while, while people go off to march? stories um, elsewhere. I remember when I, we first started work, I remember hearing stories. Do you remember the story of these women who were trying to save trees in India? There's a name for it, and I can't recall what they did was because for development, um, uh, the, uh, they were cutting down trees to develop the area, but poor women depended on these trees for firewood, for instance, and their husbands don't understand that either because the women who cooks and feeds the children who understand that need. And so these poor women, went and um, tied themselves to the trees and they saved the trees. It's quite a famous example. Um, another one was domestic violence where women came together. Again, this is an Indian story in the village. And whenever they heard a uh, woman being beaten up, the women got together in their kitchens. They took the pots and pans and started banging together and so embarrassed the person who was abusing his partner. Uh, so you can, they can take action and they do take action when, especially when it affects their personal lives, you know, and uh, which other people don't understand, like saving the forest, for instance, because women depend on firewood. Yeah, somebody's left a comment, uh, Sammy has left a comment saying, I think that it was the chip coal movement. That's right. Yes, um, it was. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you. Uh, Marsara, do you want to address this question about uh, kind of privilege and space? Yeah. Um, uh, definitely. I think, you know, from what like Connie and Rachel said, I think there's someone involved in the scene who grew up working class, but, you know, your family eventually you know, went through social mobility. I think that has been a very interesting experience because, um, you know, like some things that people have said to me would be, you know, an assumption that I grew up like middle class. You know, you're middle class Malay, you're articulate, like what Connie said, right? Like we had the privilege of being articulate. So people assume that you grew up like middle class or upper class, you know? Um, because, you know, it also comes from the biasness about what you assume of marginalized identities. That you, they are not articulate, they are not intelligent enough and things like yeah. that. So mm -hmm. I remember the podcast I did for New Narrative with PJ Tam, I said, um, I know I had the privilege that Chinese people would listen to me because I'm articulate. They wouldn't listen to a working class Malay man or working class demo man, you know. Um, so I had that privilege of education, you know. But that said, I would say like my biggest support would come from my mom. She didn't go to university. She only has the O levels. She may not understand issues like in the same way I do, but I would say I had the best conversations about social issues with her because she grew up less privileged than I did, you know? And so this is all this assumption that, you know, um, oh, someone who is articulate or, you know, like understand issues must be like educated which is to me not true, you know, people, different people have different ways of understanding issues, you know, so like food delivery, you know, um, dri drivers, you know, they would understand the issue of class differently from like us, for mm -hmm. example, but that doesn't mean that the way they talk about it is any less intelligent, any less like um, important than what we do. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, Going on to the next question that I've got on Slido, uh, and maybe this relates again to what we've some of what we've been discussing about bandwidth and people's um, the amount of space that people have in their lives. How do we encourage people to care about these issues? Uh, I guess I'm not sure which which issues here, but the question says these issues when there are competing priorities in their daily lives. Um, and I guess the question then says rather than just preaching to the choir. Um, so does anybody want to 
take this question on? That's always the danger, preaching to the choir. And every time we hold a meeting or we have a forum or we are talking, we are preaching to the choir. And who are the ones who are listening to us? People who are interested in these topics. So the huge question that advocates have for advocacy work is how do we reach people we need to reach? How do we do that? Um, mass media helps, um, but we don't have very much of that. Uh, we talked about um, social networking, the virtual space. But again, virtual space is again a privileged space. Uh, even even uh, of uh, people who are of a certain age, we don't reach. And we tend to all live in a silo, you know, of like minded people, um, which is where um, mass media, media can help with the discussions, you know. Um, and debates and have open open debates and open discussions. And that's a way of educating citizens. Um, we are at a disadvantage here. So I don't know, you young people have ideas. Uh, you may have, you may have. Yeah, um, I'm also reminded of the previous question, I think. To care is also a privilege in itself. Um, and yeah, I, I think I see a lot of things as containing intersections, the power and privilege. When Connie was sharing about media, um, I'm also reminded of how the media is also saturated or controlled by a certain group or a certain community and they themselves hold their own prejudices and their own agendas in bringing content into the space. Um, in relation to um, the climate action movement, for instance, um, the fact that fossil fuel companies were able to fund um, advertising, fund scientists to actively and intentionally change the way that people saw environmental harm. Um, so it's difficult when we are pushing for narratives that are running against the current of those that are dominant and those who are powerful and who have the control, uh, economic control that we don't. And I think, unfortunately, in this world, economic control gives you a lot of power. Um, but aside from that, when the question came up about how do we get people to care about these issues of competing priorities, um, something that occurred to me a few years ago was that I guess the essence of being human is that we care for some things or some people in our lives. Um, even the biggest bully in school has a soft spot and understanding how these issues that we care about have impact on overlap with the people that they love. Um, we talk about gender rights um, and how gender is an, is an identity that people in everyone's lives will hold, right? Um, your mom, your sister, your friend, um, for environmental issues, no one can run away from these things. And what helps for me is to think of these issues um, in relation to different things that different people care about um, and breaking down what action will look like in a way that's accessible, in a way that everyone can do, which is still challenging in itself. Something that occurred to me while we were talking about the media, that media is also subjected to laws, just like civil society is. And over the years, you know, uh, when you start worrying about what constrains you, you normalize those constraints. And sometimes, of course, um, I know, I, I, uh, I'm just remembering what the media was like before. 
that uh, printing and is it printing and oh, there was an act that came which meant they were always under threat of closure. Yeah, the licensing regime. Yeah. Mm. Late 70s, I think it was. Yeah, that's right. Late 70s, yeah. And of course, also quite a number of journalists were interned, especially the journalists from the Chinese media, were in, they were more independent, interned under the ISA through 1970s, yeah. So there is always a history mm. of in, institutions, the way the institutions are, are. There is a history and it's a history we had to address and we have to go back and challenge those, you know. Uh, we are all trapped, including the government because they don't know what to do. You know, we are all trapped in a culture that they created. Mm and they don't know how to get out of it. Um, Marcelo, do you want to add, add anything on this question of how we reach yeah, people? I, I think whenever people ask me about my like works, whether it's my writings or my installations, films, is that um, if a machi down the road cannot understand what I'm trying to say, I have failed. Um, so language has always been um, very important, I think, in the work I do, you know, um, am I, whether it's in terms of, you know, the medium that I use or even the language that I use when I write. Um, because, you know, of course you realize that when you do a piece of work, sometimes, you know, it reaches out to the same group of people, right? Because these are the group of people who, who are actively seeking out to kind of educate themselves or things like that. Um, and of course, you know, when, when you grow up working class, you, you, I am very much aware that my parents' priorities differ from me, you know, especially when they were like my age. Um, and, and that, but that doesn't mean they don't care. You know, obviously it doesn't mean that they don't care, but also then the question would like, you know, are we doing enough to make our language um, in the works we do, whether it's civil society, you know, art, whatever it is, accessible to them in the first place. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves like, oh, why don't these people care? But actually, you know, uh, do they even understand what we're trying to say in the first place? So I think that is like very important to me that the language that we use, you know, you know, sometimes we are preaching to the choir because only that choir understands us. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we just quickly jump in. I think also with relation to what we talked about community, sometimes preaching in the choir is what brings the community together, right? Um, there are these events that you know you see the same people again. Um, you say goodbye, but there's like a... There's it makes you feel good. Yeah, you know that, you know that there will always yeah. be these people you can fall back on. And, um, I think that's but it grows, that well. you know, the community grows. And mm. that's important. It has grown over the... Since I started... Uh, uh, civil society activism, it has grown. And there are more and more young people like yourself, for instance, involved. And 10, 15 years ago, people didn't even understand the concept of civil society. Now everybody speaks openly about civil society. So it is changing. Yeah, I mean, just, you just to, uh, to butt in here and uh, kind of bang a drum again a little bit. Like, I mean, I haven't done this for, for a long time now, but I remember when I was at WHERE and uh, we were working on issues of single mothers access to housing, one of the things that just became very apparent is that you can't ask single parents to participate in anything unless you provide childcare. Yeah. So that's a very simple example of like identifying a barrier that prevents people from participating in something that they actually, they very much have lots of thoughts, views, and in many ways, uh, almost always the best knowledge about and they, they're things that they would like to do um, but there's a practical reason why they may not see getting involved in a collective action to create change as, as feasible right um, and my, my suspicion is that that's, that's very much true across, across every single possible kind of change that, could, that we might want to be looking at in society that this often very material reasons mm. why people who are most affected um, actually need also, support. I think to... Also, in Singapore, we have to realize that the state 
it is the biggest employer and uh, your employment contract limits activism and then the state is also the biggest property owner so there are so many others the state is in your face every day and so just by having conversations like this uh, empowers us to break loose from those kinds of control that um, we fear I might lose my job, I might lose my HDB flat, you know, uh, whatever. And, and you know, laws keep changing. So you can't even depend on, on the legal system to, to stay where it is now. It might change tomorrow. And what I say today may not be amenable or acceptable. So those kind of fears, but, but the thing about civil society activism is you live through those fears mm -hmm. and, uh, and you force change. And I say, said that over the 30, 40 years, it has changed. In spite of all those draconian laws, you know, we have more laws now than ever before. But young people are coming out and speaking up. You are like a mind reader, Connie, because this was the next question. Oh, uh, in the slide oh, was how to cope with the fear of being activists, like it might affect your career or being blacklisted by the state. I mean, this yeah. is we probably only have time to get to answer this question and then we'll we'll have to um call it a night. But um I, Rachel, would I you like think, to uh, let anything? me just say the more of us speak up the less likely are we to be yeah. sad, right? <laughs> like everybody in the office. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I have these dreams. I have these dreams that everybody could do something together. If we get the whole school yeah. to stand at the lawn, they can't expel everyone. Yeah. Um, but then everyone has the same thought, right? Like, what if I do it but other people don't? Um, and I think this question reminded me of this tension that I have been thinking about between um, working within the boundaries and recognizing that these boundaries that are established by the state and the institution are underlyingly undemocratic. Um, they are unjust yeah. in some of the yeah. values that they propagate. Um, and one thing as a as a sign kind of resisting these structures that bound us. Um, I think fear in, has been mitigated with the former, where we stay safe, um, we play under the rules. We don't call it a sign-making event, we call it a, an art expression event, right? Everyone can express art, but not everyone can make signs and protest. Um, but at the same time, understanding that when we make the decision to play with the rules of the game, we are also being complicit um, to the injustices that it seeks to perpetuate, right? And I think one way that that manifests in, in how my work in school, um, I recognize an overwhelming uh, majority of locals participating in these nature of events as compared to internationals, right? Because locals, um, we are citizens of this country, they can't send us anywhere. Um, but internationals are like, we need, we can't be deported, essentially. And um, I think it's been interesting going through that process of looking through the rule book um, and into its nitty gritty, inviting um, legal experts to tell us which lines we can cross and which lines we can't. And again, this reminds me of um, how challenging it is to reclaim back our power as people, um, our power as agents who want to take ownership over our future and how that resistance can unfold and take place. Thanks. I have a story to tell. Do you have time? Um, I was hoping that we could give my Sarah a chance to answer. Oh, okay. and I feel yeah. like we might be into the last uh, okay, okay. wrapping up okay. that Jennifer would want to do, but um, let's see. Why don't, okay, how about my Sarah? Yes. You go and then okay. we'll see. Well, I think obviously the fear will always be there, but I think it's about overcoming 
it, you know, um, knowing and I guess that's where the comedy comes in, right? You know, who do you get? Who who is there for you? Who can you fall back on when you know things get difficult? Um, and and I guess at the end of the day, also knowing that you know if there's some sort of resistance from the state, then you are doing the right. Connie, you have to tell my story. Uh, uh, I, 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 I direct this question to Jennifer. Does she have time, Jennifer? Short story. It is, you know, because we were talking more, we were talking about we are privileged, you know. And I, I remember, I remember a, a project that, um, that Drama Box did. I saw Shirley So's name. I think she's listening in. So she was involved. So group of artists, Drama Box, uh, was involved in a, in an HDB uh, block, um, and I forget where it was, but in, it involved it engaged, and it was a year long project. It wasn't easy. It engaged the residents, so it's a it's a community where you have lots of Malays, Chinese, Indians living in the same block, and they go about their life as strangers to each other. But this project brought them together. They shared food, they shared experiences, they shared evenings together. And then also they, their work, the community was involved in, in, um, in decorating the void deck. And it became a lively place for the community to get together and meet. And it was organized by civil society activists, but it directly impacted uh, residents of a particular block. And I thought that was, uh, and Drama Box and other organizations do that kind of work, you know? So there is a lot of work going on which directly addresses problems in the community with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. I'm sorry, I'm so brutal. <laughs> no, 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 no. I thought it was important because we often think of ourselves as separate group. We are not a separate group. We are working with the communities who, and in this case, you know, to bring people together um, was important. You know, we have this public policy about having so many percentage Malay, so many percentage Indians and so many percent but we don't know each other. So we have to have these kind of projects that an outside organization can do to bring people together. Okay, well, I'm afraid um, time has flown. We seem to be pretty much at the end of our schedule, but I just wanted to thank uh, everybody on the panel for kind of this really uh, kind of rich and engaging discussion so thank you thank you for that and also to thank the audience for um your interesting questions and for uh staying with us through this event i hope that you found it uh rewarding to attend and i will now uh hand over to thank jennifer you, Rachel and Marisa. i have to thank them because i learned so much from them and i'm so impressed that you have young people coming up and doing the work they do thank you so much yeah Thanks, Jolene. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, yes, I must say I was so captured by the conversation that my two ethos books colleagues, I was supposed to help to, to, to tidy up the notes, but I was like so enraptured in the last few minutes, I didn't help. Um, but not to worry, those um, in the Zoom, we will upload a full edited transcript. Okay, so please don't mind the, the misspellings and everything. Yeah. Um, thank you so much um, to the panel for the conversation. Um, for those um, in the Zoom with us, please feel free to leave your thanks in the chat box, um, leave suggestions for what you'd like to see next as well. Um, and the panel can read it after, after the session as well. Um, I want to thank the panel because it's very paradoxical because now it's 10 p.m. in Singapore. So I'm both very tired and very energized by the conversation. And I think it really shows how important such conversations are. Um, I hope everyone here takes the energy that you have gained from the panel and please um, redistribute it to your work around you, whether or not you are directly working in society. Um, of course, tomorrow is Sunday, so please take a rest tomorrow and, and think about it, you know, a little what we write. But um, yeah, I really want to thank the panel for giving their energy and their, their words to us tonight. Um, so in closing, um, yes, and please feel free to leave your feedback in the chat box. Um, so in closing, I just want to 
let everyone know, you know, the projects that the panel has been working on so that you can continue to follow their work. So if you're interested to know more about Connie and, and you know, what she has done and what she's going to continue doing, you can read her, her newly republished memoir, um, which was published by Ethos Books just last week called um, Where I Was, as well as her new essay in Making Kin Eco-Feminist Essays from Singapore. We have also had the privilege of publishing After the Inquiry by Jolene, and um, Alfian Saad calls her novel an examination into the dark soul of Singaporean bureaucracy. So I think those of you with us will probably be interested to see her, her take on it. Um, my Sarah also has a very exciting publishing project coming up. Maybe my Sarah can just share a bit. Um, yes, I think it's the first time we're announcing it. Um, we're making Brown into uh, Brown is Sarah into an anthology. So Chris, Yen, and I are editing the book right now, and it's going to feature a couple of um, brown writers in Singapore. So we're very excited, and we're publishing it with Ethos. So hoping to get it out, like, hopefully end of the year. Mm. And I think we'll also be running a very short open call soon. So those who are interested, just stay tuned to the Ethos book social media. And uh, last but not least, um, Rachel, how can we support the work of uh, Students for a Fossil Free Future? Thanks, Jennifer. Um... Right now, we are recalibrating our new strategy and direction, and you can expect to hear from us after the holidays. Yes. When we are able to finally get back to work, um, you can check out our social media and looking forward to be connected with more of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, good night, everyone. And um, can I also ask the panel to stay back? You know, we're awkward, right? Sometimes, like, everyone will leave and be like, no, 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 I'll stop the panel. So, um, can I invite the rest? of the, the participants to um, leave, uh, have a good night. And yeah, we'll, we'll see you soon. And uh, the panel stay back so that we can just yeah, wrap up. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Yes, thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye, good night. Good night.